Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I welcome you all to worship here at Westminster. Uh, as you are joining us via Facebook or the internet, uh, we do uh, thank you for your presence here today as we continue to faithfully follow in service uh, and worship of our God. Uh, today we observe and acknowledge uh, the 4th of July and the independence of this country, and we just uh, praise our Lord for the freedom um, and all the liberty that He has given us that we enjoy in this country. And even though we still have a long ways to go as a people of God, we uh, continue to faithfully follow after Him uh, and to live in the freedom that He has given us and to share that freedom with others. Uh, today is Communion Sunday, and we will also celebrate that later in the service. And so we encourage you to uh, find some elements at home, um, bread and juice, and we just ask that you uh, prepare yourself as we take the Lord's Supper together. Uh, we are excited as well to announce that starting next Sunday, we are going to have a chance to worship in person together here on the property of Westminster. Uh, for the, the final three weeks in July, we will be worshiping outside on our front patio uh, at 9.30, and we encourage you to come. Families and those who'd like can bring lawn chairs and blankets for our grass area, uh, but we'll also have chairs in the, the front of our parking lot for those um, who need a little firmer ground. Uh, we will still have nursery available and children's church, and so we uh, encourage you to come. There will be some um, adjustments that will be made, and we'll have parking lot attendants and ushers to direct you uh, so that we can keep everyone safe and, again, abide by the social distancing and some of the guidelines that are in place. Uh, but we are excited uh, to join together in worship. Uh, however, we will continue to live stream our service for those who still are unable or are uncomfortable coming to worship in person. Uh, it will be available still online through our Facebook and our YouTube channels, uh, both live and uh, later in the week as well. And so we are excited about what God is doing in our ministry here at Westminster. Um, I would like to invite up Pastor Britt as she's going to share an announcement about the youth and then also um, our upcoming VBS program. So we're having a youth event this Wednesday. We're going to meet here at the church, and it will go from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., and we're going to go for a nice walk, unless, you know, the weather's really awful, and then we'll stay indoors and play some games, and we're also going to have lunch together. So if you plan on coming, let me know so I can just make, an, have, make sure there's enough lunch for everybody. And so, yeah, excited to see you all there. And news about VBS... Uh, Cindy Goskison is now going to tell us. Thanks. Hi, Faith Quest families, and I'd like to include all of you grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, anyone who has a child in their life. I'm so happy to say that VBS will be happening this year, but it will have a twist to it. Instead of you bringing your children to the church for VBS, we are emailing VBS to your homes, to your families. And this will be a free, free program. So starting tomorrow, July 6th, I'll be emailing our church young families and those who contact me a quarantine-friendly VBS called Bolt. You can use this VBS any day you'd like, any time of day you like. You just plan your own schedule. It's so simple. Now, to use Bolt, there's very little preparation, easy to follow instructions, and a video that leads your family and your kids step by step through each, each of the three days. Bolt is designed for you to do at home as a family. There will be games, origami, music, Bible memory and stories that will illustrate what it means to listen to and focus on and follow Jesus. There's even a pause break for you to have a snack time. 
Now, depending on your pace, you can expect your, your experience to last about an hour and a half. It's great for ages four and up and for one or many children. Even middle and high school students will enjoy this program. Now, if you want a better idea of how BOLT will be working, please go to our church's Facebook page and scroll down to the June 23rd uh, post about BOLT VBS. There's a clickable link for you to view and get an idea of what's going on, but please don't let your kids see that yet. There's something else that I'm really excited about with BOLT. This is a great opportunity to, to share as an outreach. If you feel safe and comfortable with gathering with a few other people, you are welcome to invite a friend, neighbor, or other family members to your home to enjoy Bolt together. Now, if you prefer, you can just forward that email that I'll be sending out to your friends and other family members. So this is why anyone who knows any child in their, or has a child in their life, how you can share this so easily with anyone. And it's easy, and it's a great way to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'd also love to hear from you. So please confirm with me your email address to register or to be included in the, in the Bolt email list. Just email me at christianed at westminsteraustin.com. Please include your name your email contact information, your children's birth dates and grades. And you can sign up anytime this summer to do this too. But remember, it ends at the um, at late August. So I'm really excited about Bolt, and I hope you are too. So this is going to be so much fun, and I hope you enjoy it. And it'd be great to hear from you as to how your week went doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, and uh, we indeed are excited about the ability to, to offer VBS and uh, the creativity uh, that we're calling on this year. It'll be a great time, so I encourage you to invest in that. Um, also, uh, now I want to uh, prepare us for worship. Uh, on this 4th of July weekend, we will sing the, the wonderful hymn, America the Beautiful, and so I encourage you at home or wherever you're at, to stand, and if you need the words, they'll be up on the screen as we sing together America the Beautiful, hymn number 727.
And now for our prayer of confession. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change, and open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. And hear the good news that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And if you have your Bibles with you, turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. That's Matthew, chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light." This is God's word for us today. But when I hear you whisper, child, lift up your head. 
I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet. I am redeemed. You set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain. Now I'm not who I used to be. Because I don't have to be the old man inside of me Cause his day is long dead and gone Because I've got a new name, a new life, I'm not the same And a hope that will carry me home I am redeemed You set me free So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain, cause I'm not who I used to be, I am redeemed, I am redeemed. Special thank you to Richard and Laura uh, for that beautiful piece and for leading us in worship. And uh, we are uh, also thankful for Catherine and her wonderful playing of the church organ. Um, also, um, Cindy for her words. And behind the scenes, Dominic and Eric, as always, uh, helping to, to lead us in worship today. Uh, it is our time now to come before our God in prayer. And so I lift up uh, these concerns from our congregation. And if there are others that uh, you know about that you'd like prayers for, continue to email them to the church office, and we will uh, pray for them Tuesday mornings with our prayer team, as well as include them in worship on Sundays. And so today, continued prayer for Jim as he uh, returned home from the hospital uh, this past Wednesday with his surgery, uh, with his sinus cancer, and just got a report that he's doing fairly well up and around, so we'll continue to pray for Jim. Um, I'd ask prayers for my brother-in-law, Dennis, that we've been praying for. Uh, he is suffering some side effects from uh, the medication and the, the treatment he's receiving now, and so just continue to lift him up in your prayers. And I do have an announcement. Uh, Jill B. Um, has been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and she will be having a lumpectomy on July 24th. And so her and her family would like prayers for her, and we will uh, lift her up. I will continue to be in prayer for Jim and Jan, who uh, con contracted the, the virus um, a couple weeks ago, and they're self-quarantined, and uh, all accounts they're doing okay. Continue to pray for them. I will lift up Betsy, uh, who is doing well, and they're trying to balance her medication so that she can receive her uh, steroid treatment for her um, cardiovascular issues. And we also have been praying for Suzanne. Uh, continue to pray for her as she's receiving chemo treatments and to help her with her heart and lung issues. Um, and so we will lift them up in our prayers. But as always, we celebrate those that are um, have milestones and birthdays today. So. We lift up Jeremy, his birthday is today, and pray for Kim and John. Their birthdays are uh, tomorrow, and on the 7th, we'll pray for Cindy and Carol. And on the 8th, praying for the twins, Ariana and Olivia. On the 9th, we can uh, praise God for Luke and his birthday, and then on the 10th, Austin's birthday. Uh, and so happy birthday to all of you, and we will celebrate with you. Uh, but now let us go before our God in prayer. Lord God, we have just heard the beautiful song that I have been redeemed. God, that is such a praise, uh, just a blessing for us all today to realize the redemption that has come from you. For Lord, we can look into our paths and we can see the issues and the struggles that you have pulled us out of. Lord, the darkness, the brokenness, the pain, the struggles. 
you are present in those and you are willing to reach down to grab us by our hands and pull us into your light and into your love. But Lord, in order to receive that, we have to believe in you. We have to accept the gift of grace that you offer. And as we do, then we will be lifted out of whatever pain and struggle we are facing. God, today as a country, as a world, we are facing pain like we've never seen it. We're dealing with a virus that is now rearing its head again in our country. Lord, we're dealing with racial inequalities, unrest that uh, uh, have been known throughout the globe and throughout history. We're dealing with personal issues of safety and protection and fear of the unknown. Lord, this world, our country, we are in a time of darkness. But it is in you that we can again be brought into the light. Our Heavenly God, as we have celebrated our country's independence and we are appreciative and blessed by the freedoms and liberties that we receive, we know, God, there is still much work to be done. We ask that as a people that you can lead us and guide us into your truth and into your presence so that injustice may be wiped away, that inequalities may be no more, and that all can freely worship, can freely work and walk and, and live in this country and in your world. And so God, we take a moment now of silent meditation, praying for your freedom and your grace and your love to be shared across this land. Hear our prayers, O Lord. We thank you, God, for listening to our prayers, and we trust that you are the one that can bring peace to all, and we ask that your love and your grace will again wash over your creation so that all can be equal in your eyes, as we know that we are. Lord, we want to lift up the individual requests that have been shared. We continue to pray for Jim, and thank you that he is at home recovering we lift up Jill as she's dealing with a difficult diagnosis and ask for her upcoming surgery, Lord, that you will pour your love and your blessing over that. We pray for Dennis, continue to walk with him as he is suffering the side effects of his treatment. We pray for Jim and Jan and ask for their continued recovery. And We lift up Betsy for the balance of her medication and we thank you that she is doing well. We pray for your continued blessing in her life. We also lift up Suzanne, who is uh, receiving treatment, and we pray, God, that you will bring your healing hand over her life as well. And so we lift these concerns to you, God, but we also celebrate the joys of life. Again, the freedoms that we have experienced in this country, we praise you for it, God. And we also celebrate those uh, living in their milestones of their birthdays. We thank you for the blessing that they are in all of our lives. As we lift up Jeremy, Kim, John, Cindy, Carol, Ariana, Olivia, Luke, and Austin. Let them enjoy their day and let them just live in the, the fellowship and love that they receive. And so, God, we thank you and praise you again for all that you are in our lives, and we ask that you will continue to bless us in our worship today. We pray this in your name. Amen. And as we prepare for the offertory, we encourage you uh, to continue to find ways to give faithfully at home, whether financially, whether it's through uh, your love and support of others, or just the sharing of your gifts and your talents. And so let us be encouraged by these words from 2 Corinthians. 
God is able to make all things abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Lord, we ask that you will bless these gifts that are being made today in your name. May you empower them and use them to bring about your truth and your peace here in um, the creation in which we live. And we thank you and praise you. Amen. join me in our confession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, if you're standing at home, you may be seated, um, and I hope you are got a comfortable seat where you're at um, on this warm and muggy uh, summer day, uh, but we do praise God for all that he gives us and the blessings that we receive. Uh, we're continuing our story as we work through the uh, Genesis, 
Uh, Today we're looking at the 24th chapter, and we are coming to a conclusion of our time that we've spent with Abraham and Sarah, and now Sarah, or Abraham's offspring, are now going to be starting to take center stage. And today we are learning about the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah. And this is a long chapter, chapter 24, and we will be making reference to it throughout the sermon, but for our purpose, I've narrowed the text down to Genesis 24, 10 through 21. So let us read together the word of God. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all kinds of choice gifts from his master. And he set out and went to Aram Naharaim, to the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water. It was toward evening and time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. I am standing here by the spring of water. And the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I say, please offer your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, there was Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, coming out with her water jar on her shoulder. The girl was very fair to look upon, a virgin which no man had known. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me sip a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered her jar upon his hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw. And she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. We praise God for his word this morning and the fact that this is a living, breathing word of God. Amen. Well, today's scripture is the account of how Isaac found his wife. How Rebecca was led to follow the, the servant's request to provide a wife for Isaac. And you might wonder, again, I referred to the fact that this is a long chapter. This is, in fact, the longest chapter in Genesis. Most of the narrative accounts of the stories we hear in this book are between 10 and 20 verses. But today we have 67 verses dedicated to this account of courtship. In fact, Genesis 1, the great creation account um, that we have read um, at the beginning of the summer, that only has 31 verses. So what makes this story so important and what makes it so worthy of receiving the attention and the length of what the Holy Scripture gives it. Well, I think it speaks to that ultimate relationship that God has created, that relationship of marriage, and how God has blessed it and sustained it throughout history. And I can't help but think back on my own courtship with my lovely bride, Colleen, who's at home. Good morning, sweetie. And I can think of the time in which I was preparing as a a nervous uh, 23-year-old to to ask her father and her mother for her hand in marriage, Um, and just that whole process. 
I can remember it very clearly. And I went into it fully expecting and knowing what the answer would be. But there was always a question. There was always a, um, just a what if in the back of my mind. But I knew that the answer was going to be yes, which it was, and we could praise God for that. But I knew it was going to be yes because of the commitment, the faithfulness, and the preparation that we as a couple had embarked upon. And that's what I think marriage in any relationship is about. The commitment, striving for that, focusing on it, the faithfulness. And also preparing yourself for what God has in store. And this is what we find in our text this morning. We find God seeking the commitment, the faithfulness, and the preparation from His wonderful daughter of faith, Rebecca. And so as we enter into it, let us understand again where where we're at in the narrative God had made his promise to Abraham and Sarah that they would have a long lineage and that he would bless them and they would be fruitful. But now Abraham is 140 years old. Sarah is nearing the end of her life and still Isaac is without a wife. And so Abraham sends his trusted servant out, his highest servant, to go out into his homeland, his country, and to find a wife for his son. And Abraham sent the servant out with three stipulations. He said to be careful to not select a wife from the Canaanite women where he was currently at. Not that there was anything wrong with Canaanite women, but understand the lineage that God was creating with with his people. And so it's important that a wife be chosen from Abraham's family. And so that was the second stipulation, to choose someone from Abraham's relatives. And then finally, Abraham told the servant not to take Isaac back to his homeland. Isaac must stay where he was, because Abraham did not want Isaac to have any thoughts of returning back to where God had led them all from. And so we see that the Lord is leading this process. And he wanted to ensure, Abraham wanted to ensure that his descendants would remain true to the land that God had called them to. And so Abraham sends his servant out, confidently knowing that God would bless him and God would provide a wife. And that's where we encountered our servant today. He was given his instructions. He was sent on his way. It was a long journey from Hebron to Mesopotamia. But when he arrived, he, before he did anything, he entered into prayer. And in our scripture, we see this prayer that the servant makes. And he bases his prayer around his desire for God's will to happen. He bases it around his need for his own guidance and wisdom. He prays for his willingness to follow and obey whatever God leads. And he asks for alertness to be able to understand and to do what God is asking him to do. And so he enters into this prayer, and before he can even finish, God begins to bless and to answer. We see in this unfinished prayer, we see a young, beautiful woman emerge as Rebecca comes to the well. But today, I don't want us to be caught up too much in the romanticism of this story. This was not a, a movie on the Hallmark Channel. Um, this is, there was much more to this encounter. This was about maturity and faith and commitment. Walter Brueggemann, the great theologian of our time, says, This text nurtures a mature faith that resists both an easy romanticism and a hard cynicism. 
This is indeed a love story. But it's a love story about how much God loves his children. How much he will provide for them as they faithfully walk with him. And so our servant acted by faith in God, but also faith in his master, Abraham. He believed in the promise that God had made, and he trusted that God would provide a direction for him. And so he took time to pray before he acted. And as he prayed, God blessed him with exactly what he was hoping for. And so we see in our passage that it is rooted in a willing commitment, an unquestioning faithfulness, and an intentional preparation that the bride is making for her bridegroom. So first of all, let's look briefly at Rebecca's willingness to commit. Verse 18, she comes to the, the wearied traveler and says, Drink, my Lord. And quickly she gave him a drink. And after she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too, until they have had enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the well time and time again for more water until all the camels had had enough. Rebecca is committed to her duty and to her service. Without even knowing this traveler, she offers her own resources of time, of energy, and commitment. Not just to the man, but his whole entourage. She immediately offers water to the guest, and then without prompting, offers water to the camels. Now again, this was a long trip from Hebron to Mesopotamia, roughly 900 miles that could be done fairly reasonably in about two months with the large traveling group, which this was. There were 10 camels that came along, as Scripture tells us. And a camel can drink easily between 25 and 30 gallons of water after a long journey. So do the math. 250 to 300 gallons of water for this young woman to provide to this entire group. There had to be an amazing level of internal commitment. She was committed to her calling as a child of God. She knew the importance of hospitality in the desert in which she lived. She knew what it meant to show love and care and compassion for a stranger. And she knew that God had called her to this life of service and sacrifice. And so without prompting, Rebecca demonstrates her nature as a committed servant of her God. And that leads us into her second trait, she has an unquestioning faithfulness. As our drama plays out through this long chapter, we see that the servant now is meeting with uh, Rebecca's family and asking for her hand to, to come with her so that he can present her to Isaac. And so uh, Rebecca's brother Laban and her mother um, start this debate with uh, the servant. In verse 55, it says her brother and her mother replied, let the young woman remain with us for 10 days, then you may go. But the servant said, do not detain me now that the Lord has granted success to my journey. Send me on your way so I may go to my master. Well, they thought a compromise. Well, let's call the young woman and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go with this man? And her response, I will go. I will go. Now we know that there must have been a sense of excitement, a sense of privilege, for she had just received some lavish gifts from this traveler and was being told this romantic story of a distant love. But at the moment of truth, when she is asked if she will leave, all of that romanticism goes by the wayside. And she says, I will go. 
even with her family giving her a way out to wait 10 days to see if this will really work. She says, no, I will go now. True faith doesn't need to wait. True faith responds. True faith follows. She didn't know what she was agreeing to, she, but she knew that God was calling her to this. Deep within her soul, she knew that her God was leading her and that the, this was her moment to faithfully respond and to begin to live out her calling. And so Rebecca faithfully followed. And then finally, we see that Rebecca then begins to prepare for purity. At the end of the chapter, after their long journey back, Rebecca and the servant and the entourage, they finally make it back to Abraham's homeland. Isaac is off in the distance meditating and praying. And as she sees him, there's this dialogue that happens. She says, she got down from her camel and asked the servant, who is this man in the field that is coming to meet him? He is my master. Well, then Rebecca, she took her veil and she covered herself. See, upon seeing the bridegroom, Rebecca covered herself in what is believed to be a full-length veil. It was customary for a bride to cover herself before her groom, as a sign both of preparation and purity. It is similar to our traditions today of a bride wearing white and not seeing the groom uh, until the actual wedding ceremony. This is what Rebecca is doing now as she saw her future husband coming towards her. There is some thinking that she wore this veil in front of him until the day of their actual marriage. She was preparing herself for her husband. At the end of a long, hot, and hard journey with no doubt a sense of uneasiness and even perhaps regret, Rebecca's first thought was not about getting settled. It was about preparation. It was about purity. That's what she sought after. See, and that's what this whole passage represents. It represents the calling of commitment, faithfulness, preparation, and purity. It lets us know that God is always at work with His people. We see His presence and His leading step every part of the journey. But Rebecca had to make her choice for Isaac. She had to demonstrate her own levels of commitment, faithfulness, and preparation. We see at work here God's plan, but also humanity's choice. That's what this love story is really all about. It's about God's people choosing their groom, choosing their husband. I believe that there is another love story that's unfolding here in this passage. It is giving us a foretaste of what will come. And it is telling us the story of Jesus Christ and His church. Scripture throughout the New Testament tells us that Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. Matthew 25, we hear the parable of ten virgins preparing themselves for their bridegroom. Second Corinthians, Paul speaks of the church being promised to their husband, Christ. And then listen to these words out of Ephesians. Husbands are called to love their wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or blemish, but holy and blameless. And then in Revelation 19, we see the vision of the holy wedding between Christ and His church. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory, 
For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. For linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Just as Rebecca was called to be the bride of Isaac, we too, as God's church, are called to be the bride of Christ. Joel Ryan, an author for Christianity.com, uh, speaks, speaks well on this. And he says, With Christ's life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection, Jesus became the living embodiment of the bridegroom and a faithful husband who was willing to give up his life for the one whom he loved. Through Christ's sacrifice, intimacy with the Father can be restored and sins forgiven. Through Christ's atonement, we are presented to God with the purity of a virgin on her wedding day. With God's covenant relationship with the Israelites remained through his son, he formed a new covenant with all who believe in Jesus Christ and surrendered to his lordship. Those who believe are called the church. And as Christ's church to be faithful, and as Christ promised to be faithful to his church, he described his expectations for the church's relationship as his bride. We are the bride of Christ. We need to live like Rebecca, striving for commitment, faithfulness, preparation, and purity. Let us each be drawn in our own way to a sacrificial and a serving love that we offer to Christ by offering to others. Without prompting or in search of a reward, let us serve those around us. Let us offer unwavering, unwavering faithfulness to the calling of our God. Let's stop waiting 10 days to see if the mood is right or if the timing works. Let's boldly and recklessly follow the calling of our God. And let's see our Savior approaching and seek to prepare ourselves with purity. Let us cast off our old clothing and put on the wedding clothes of Christ. For he has cleansed us and purified us. So let's cover ourselves in his veil, in his clothing. We are his bride. Let us be faithful. Let us be ready. Let us wait with anticipation of that glorious day in which we will be united with Christ and live in harmony with him forever and ever. This is our calling as his people to commit to Him, to be faithful to Him, and to prepare ourselves for Him. Let us do so as the bride of Christ, as the church of Christ. Amen. Now I would invite you to stand at home as we prepare for communion by singing uh, the hymn, Let Us Break Bread Together. It's hymn number 699, and we will prepare ourselves for his holy supper.
may be, re- be seated at home as we indeed prepare ourselves for this holy meal. For we know that this is the feast that our God has prepared for us, as the bridegroom has prepared for the bride. We know that this table is not the table of Westminster Presbyterian Church, it is the table of our God. And by coming to it, we acknowledge our belief in Him, and we praise Him for His sacrifice and His love that He has given. All who profess their faith in Jesus Christ are welcome to this table. And so let us indeed dine at the wedding feast that has been prepared for us by our God. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you in all that you do for us. We thank you that you indeed sustain us in your presence and your provision. We ask now that you will bless this meal that we are about to receive. That as we trust in you and we know the the redemption and the salvation that comes from it, Lord, that we will be encouraged, we will be blessed, and we will be transformed by your death and your resurrection. We praise you, God, for all that you have done for us. And we now ask that you will hear us as we pray the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, Scripture tells us on the night of his arrest, as he was dining with his disciples at the table, he took the bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to them, and saying, This is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat of this bread, do so in remembrance of me. The body of Christ, broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for your words to us today. We thank you for speaking to us and guiding us, for having a plan for us. We thank you for Jesus and for this meal of remembrance. And we ask that we are drawn closer to you every day and that we are guided by your wisdom and strengthened by your spirit as we live out this in our world. Amen. And now we will be singing our closing hymn, Blessed Assurance, number 426. Salvation. 
my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture, now burst on my side. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, raising my Savior. Our story is that we are the bride of Christ. We are the church of Christ. Let us continue to follow after him and to seek him in our lives together. And now let us receive God's blessing on us as we go forth into his work. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go forth in the power, peace, and protection of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.